Good afternoon. Uh, starting the next session, Professor Anil Prabhakar from IIT Madras. About Professor Anil Prabhakar, he received his PhD from Cunningham Mellon University in 97. Prabhakar is currently a faculty member in the Department of Electrical Engineering, Indian Institute of Madras. Engaged across multiple uh, laboratories and work on quantum techniques, fiber and laser opto uh, fluids. He was pre uh, previously with Reed Red Corporation, Fire, Fire Fund, uh, CA, in various capacities in search of design, characterization, production, magnetic recording, it's for hard disk drives, etc. He is a me member of Scientific Management Board. So over to Professor uh, Anil Prabhakar. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. Yeah. Um, I, uh, Thank the organizers for inviting me to talk at this conference. Uh, I apologize for not being there in person. Um, it is very difficult for me to travel this week. We are having our first classes in person with the students having come back after 18 months. So uh, with exams and classes, I think it's just impossible to travel outside Chennai. But I hope you're all having a good conference and um, I hope that I shall see, have the opportunity to see you all uh, at a future date. Let me just share my screen. I, uh, I usually don't go into a full screen mode because I can't uh, see my own slides if I do that. Uh, but I hope this is visible to everybody. Uh, yes, sir. The topic uh, is implications of quantum technologies for public key infrastructure. So I will try to give you in the next 25 minutes uh, overview of where we are on quantum technologies and how it will affect uh, our uh, public key infrastructure. Uh, a brief introduction. Uh, I uh, represent the Center for Quantum Information Communication and Computing or uh, QUIC or CQUIC at IIT Madras. And a lot of our work is done around uh, photonics. So you'll see the E is equal to H nu Einstein's equation out here. And we rely on uh, three different verticals on quantum networks, quantum computing, and quantum information. Two of these, or actually all three um, verticals uh, work together and have an effect on the topic of our discussion uh, today. I've also highlighted a couple of points in blue out here. One is two words, one is entanglement and one is superposition. So when you start thinking of quantum technologies, you should always be aware of these two words because that's what makes anything quantum. You can have superposition without entanglement and that could even be classical, it need not be quantum. But in quantum mechanics, we are looking at both entanglement and superposition. Uh, <clears throat> So the brief outline of my talk is the motivation for the quantum internet. And this has implications, as we said, on public key infrastructure. And one of the main underlying cornerstones of the quantum internet is what we call quantum key distribution. So I'll spend a little time telling you about the protocols and the hardware uh, requirements. And then I'll conclude it by talking about the quantum networks themselves and uh, how we envisage that they will come through in India. I'll start with the motivation. And uh, the motivation is, of course, our neighbor from the north, who in January of this year uh, made a big splash with this picture that shows that they have a quantum internet running from Shanghai in the south to Beijing in the north. And uh, what they have also done is they've connected it through two other cities. So Shanghai was the start, and then there is Haifei, and then there's Jinan, and then there's Beijing. And at each of these locations, they have a cluster of nodes or government buildings that are all connected on these networks. And these are quantum networks. And you can see that they have these little yellow dots and these form what are called secure nodes. And uh, they allow you to transfer keys, or secure keys from Shanghai to Beijing with adds and drops as required along the network. 
Why is this important? What they are trying to do is secure their government transactions. And they believe that there is a real possibility that someone may be cracking our public key passwords or they fear that someone may in future be able to do it and they are being prepared for it today. Uh, here is a picture actually of a quantum computer. Um, a lot of this is actually just what is called a dilution refrigerator. It uh, takes the temperature of the little chip that sits at the bottom to uh, about 0.1 milli Kelvin. Uh, which is very, I mean, in liquid nitrogen is 70 uh, Kelvin and liquid helium is 4 Kelvin. So, you're going well below liquid helium temperatures also. So, it, it's probably one of the coldest experiments that runs today. But that's not what interests us. What interests us is that if there is a quantum computer, then we believe that all these public key cryptographies are broken. So, if you look at RSA 3072 or uh, DH uh, uh, 3072, they are all compromised. Symmetric cryptography that uses AES 128 or AES 256 becomes weaker. It becomes AES 256 becomes only AES 128 and likewise. So, all these um, cryptographic schemes rely on the adversary not having sufficient computational power. But a quantum computer changes that paradigm. It means that we no longer have to use this, the regular computers and we have suddenly have exponential compute power with us that can break some of these public keys that are being used. So there is this race towards quantum supremacy, right? And uh, <clears throat> We are, we need about 10,000 qubits before we can start running near term applications. And what is the roadmap? Well, IBM has put out a roadmap, and I'm sure other uh, companies will have their own internal roadmaps that by 2023 they'll have a uh, 1,000 qubits. In 2021, actually, they've already released 127 qubits, and it will be available to researchers uh, later this month, maybe in the next few days or next week. So, if you look at such a roadmap and you understand that this is actually going to happen, you have to ask the question, is public key infrastructure insecure today? Will it be insecure tomorrow? And then I also ask another question, when will we know that it is insecure? See, if I know how to crack passwords and I am in the business of cracking passwords, I will not tell you that your password is compromised. So, it is quite possible that state or non-state actors have access to such technology for a few years before they even let us know that something like this is possible. I'm not sure, am I still online? Because I just saw something about low video bandwidth. I hope I'm online, can someone respond? Yes, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so now the question becomes, when will we know it is insecure? And we really will not know it until a few, uh, you know, public announcements are made and it could be five years or 10 years while our uh, infrastructure is compromised. Uh, I, I put out IBM's roadmap out here, but that's not necessarily the only uh, uh, computing uh, paradigm. There are other technologies, ion traps, photonic solid state, and today is not the time for me to talk on, about a lot of them. But it's important for us to understand that when, we'll, when there's this race going on towards quantum supremacy, there is a parallel race going on towards securing our public key infrastructure. Now, I am an academic and I'm on my institute is on this national knowledge network. And if you see this national knowledge network, it's connected on fiber to different metros, right? And um, the backbone 
uh, can support data rate as high as 100 gigabits per second. And it aggregates data. So the question now become to us, how should we secure this communication? What should we do? And just to understand a little bit more about how this works, uh, you have to understand that each of us doesn't use 100 gigabits per second. It's an aggregated model. And this is how it looks like, um, the aggregation looks like. So you'll have business lands that are running at about 155 megabits per second to two and a half gigabits per second. You have the residential fiber to the home. And then that goes into metros that are running at about 10 gigabits per second. And then you have the long haul, which is running at 10 to 40 gigabits per second. So each of these things are potential places where someone could eavesdrop uh, and compromise our data security. A lot of data is encrypted in storage, but not as much in transit. Okay. And uh, fiber optics is easily tapped. If you search for how to tap into an optical fiber on YouTube, you'll get videos that show you how it can be tapped. And um, so the only really truly secure way of encrypting and transmitting data is using one time pad. But one time pad requires that the data rate and the key rates be uh, equal. So when China does this demonstration, it actually stores keys and then uses the one time pad to encrypt a video. Okay. So the question that we have to ask is how do we distribute the keys? How frequently can we change the keys and how random are our keys? Now, most people like me don't change their passwords for six months, years. They use the same password across many devices, many uh, websites, and all that becomes rather insecure. And people who do cryptography will tell you that we really should not be doing that. So what are we talking about is something that you probably heard a lot of today already is that there is a public key and then there is a secret key. And the two parties, Alice and Bob, are trying to transfer plain text after encryption called cipher text between the two parties in the presence of some eavesdropper. And we are trying to do this without the eavesdropper getting any information. How do we do it in quantum key distribution? Um, oh, before we do that, let's do classical key distribution. How do we do it in classical key distribution? We use the complexity of a problem like a discrete log and say that if I have some plain text, I will create some cipher text and send it over to Bob. And Bob also, when he wants to uh, send me something, he'll send me a cipher text. And the eavesdropper only has a cipher text and does not have the plain text. And so unless she has the key, she finds it very hard to um, get the plain text. Now, this is, again, depending on the complexity of the discrete log problem. How do we do this in quantum key distribution? We say that we will establish a key with unconditional security from Alice to Bob. That means even if the eavesdropper gets some information, we will still have a secure key that can be used, right? And that key can then be used for encryption and creating the ciphertext. The security comes from some basic principles of quantum mechanics. One of them is that a photon or a quantum object cannot be cloned, which means that if a photon has gone from Alice to Bob, it cannot go to Eve. And we will set up the key only with the information that is on the photons from Alice to Bob. Why can we not do it today? Because today we send about a million photons. Every time we send a bit stream, one, zero, one, zero, we are sending millions of photons. However, if I keep removing and, or decreasing the power of the lasers, or I use some other techniques to generate single photons, I will come up with a situation where I have only one photon. And on that one photon, I will add my bit information of either one or zero. And if the eavesdropper gets that bit, then the rec receiver, Bob, does not get the bit. So imagine a scenario where Alice sends a thousand bits as her key. It's a thousand bit uh, secret word. And the eavesdropper gets 900 of them. I can still set up a hundred bit 
key between Alice and Bob. My password of 100 bits is still secure because Eve does not have them and she cannot clone them. She cannot make a copy of the 100 bits that Alice and Bob are using. The other advantage is that Eve introduces an error in the channel. So I, every time she tries to do something, I can monitor the channel and say, hey, there's an eavesdropper. And in that case, then I don't use the key that was generated and I discard that transaction. So if you look at a quantum key distribution system, it's actually a lot of information that is relying on classical uh, cryptography. There's authentication, there's sifting, error correction and privacy amplification that goes into generating the secret key and that secret key is then used to encrypt the standard communication channels. And the quantum channel runs separately. It runs at a much lower rate. It runs at about 100 kilobits per second. It could be either free space or on fiber. Free space is at 800 nanometers and fiber is at 1.55 microns. So the two are different and should not be con confused. And you do need both. Even if you're doing a satellite in free space, you cannot send the satellite signal to your office. So it will go to your receiver station and from your receiver station, you will still have to bring it on optical fiber to your offices. So there is a requirement for both of these technologies. It's always good to know what the other the rest of the world is doing. And so here's a picture um, from a, a couple of years ago of what is being done in Cambridge in the UK. So they are doing the metro parts of it where they're looking at short distances. Uh, this is about 10 kilometers between these two points, uh, um, Cape and Trell. Um, and uh, they have about two to five decibels of loss between the nodes and they get a key rate of about 256 bits keys per second. Just think about this. We think 256 bit keys per second are is low, but actually 256 bits is really sufficient if you're changing your password every second. Right? So there are ways to do this today. And uh, it's important to also uh, understand how to do it. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about it, I will uh, suggest that you read this particular um, tutorial uh, from IEEE Communications on quantum uh, communications. And uh, you will see that uh, there are many different ways of doing what we call prepare, transmit and measure. And the preparation is how do you generate the photons? The transmission is what happens over optical fiber, free space and satellite, and then the measurements themselves. I, I don't have too much time to go through all of these. So I'll touch upon a few of these things in the rest of my talk. So one of the things that you have to understand is unlike everything, everybody else, quantum key distribution, quantum communications happens with photons, right? And you have to understand photons. And that means that we are actually using some of the properties of light that we may have learned in our high school. One of the properties is polarization, the direction of polarization, you see the vertical or horizontal. If the photon is traveling along uh, out of the, out of the board. The other property is the photons have color. And this is a very simple experiment where you send white light in and it splits up into different colors. The other properties which you may or may not uh, be familiar with are these quantum properties where there are particles. Light is now thought of as a particle. It's like a tennis ball, right? Of course, much smaller, but it's, it's a particle. So it has duality. It has both wave-like behavior, like in this picture on the top left, and it has a particle number, right? And when it has this wave-like behavior, it also has a phase. So I have polarization and I have phase and I have particle number and I have color. These are the properties that we use to do quantum key distribution. I'll give you two simple examples. This example is uh, very commonly used. Uh, it's from, I think it's from the NID Quantique website. One of the companies that, uh, one of the early companies that started doing quantum key distribution. And what it does is, it says, look, let me take that one bit of information that I want to send. And let me break it into two pieces of information. One piece of information is whether the photon is polarized vertically 
or it is polarized at 45 degrees. Now, if it is vertically polarized or horizontally polarized, that's one basis. And if it is vertical, then it is a one. If it is horizontal, it is a zero. If I use the 45 degree and 135 degree basis, which is shown in red and orange, then if it is at 45 degrees, it's a one. And if it is at uh, 135 degrees, it's a zero. So now, instead of just sending one and zero, I have to send two pieces of information. One is the information on whether I chose the vertical and the horizontal polarization, which is gray and black, or whether I chose the orange and red. And in that color scheme, I have to decide whether it is vertical or horizontal, right? Or at 45 or at 135. Now, because I'm splitting this information into two pieces, it becomes harder for an eavesdropper. An eavesdropper may get one of those pieces of information and not the other one. So she may get the polarization, but she won't know whether it was a one or a zero. And by doing this, what we have established and theoretically they have proved, this was actually uh, proved uh, in 1984 in a protocol called BB84. They proved that this is now secure. Right. It's unconditionally secure if you can actually set up an experiment to do this. Similarly, there are what are called phase-based pro protocols. And in phase-based protocols, you have a phase modulator on the transmitter side and a phase modulator on the receiver side. And if the two phases are the same, if both of them are 0 and 0, then I see a signal. If 0 and pi, then I don't see a signal. And that is what is shown out here. 0 and 0, you'll get a maximum signal. And 0 and pi, you'll get a minimum. And these are very early experiments. You can see we had done this almost 11 years ago. The problem with something like this, the problem with either this experiment or with this experiment is that this fiber out here is very bad. It tends to destroy the information on the photon. So, the polarization, which is vertical, if it starts rotating in the fiber, then you suddenly lose the ability to get your uh, key bit. So that hurts you. Similarly, phase. Phase, if there is stress in the fiber or, you know, if there's a metro running next to the fiber, then every time there's strain in the fiber or there's a temperature fluctuation, you'll suddenly find that the phase changes. So to avoid these things, a separate protocol known as differential phase shift was developed. It was developed by the Japanese uh, in, I think, early 2000s. And uh, we have been using something like this in our laboratory. And I won't spend too much time describing it, but just remember that it's similar to the phase-based protocol where you have to send uh, to apply a phase difference between the transmitter and the receiver. Whereas in a differential phase scheme, you apply the phase difference between two pulses and that phase difference does not change as much because the phase when a metro runs next to your fiber that's running in milliseconds whereas we are talking about pulses that are nanoseconds so these pulses are very fast and the phase differences are not affected so this sort of a demonstration we have done in our labs to about 105 kilometers there are other uh, protocols, this one called a coherent one-way uh, protocol, where instead of sending information in the phase, you send the information in whether the photon exists or it is a vacuum state. So you're actually trying to use the energy of a photon coupled with the vacuum state energies to send information. And this is an easier protocol, but it is supposedly not as secure. Uh, there's still work going on it, but we have managed to do demonstrations up to 150 kilometers. Okay. You have to understand what these distances are, 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers. In the metro areas, like in a city like Chennai, I might be sufficient to do 30 kilometers. You know, might be 50 kilometers, might be sufficient. But if I'm trying to go from Chennai to another metro, like Bangalore, that's 350 kilometers. Hyderabad is 500 kilometers or 600 kilometers. So we do have limitations in how long these protocols can work. And those are very fundamental limitations uh, that, are, uh, that come because of the losses in optical fibers. 
So the optical fibers have a loss of in decibels per kilometer, and uh, we work at around 1.5 microns because at this wavelength the loss is the minimum. But even at minimum, 0.2 decibels per kilometer means that 100 kilometers I have 20 decibels. And to understand what a decibel means, every factor of 10 is a factor of 10. So every 10 dB is a factor of 10. So 20 decibels means a factor of 100. So if I transmit 100 photons, then only one will reach. So remember my earlier example, I said if Alice sends a thousand photons, only 100 will reach Bob. That means a 10 decibel loss was there out there, right? If she had 20 decibel loss, she sends a thousand photons, only 10 photons will reach Bob. So to circumvent some of this, what we was invented was an optical amplifier and that is put in every 100 kilometers. Right? Now the problem is that these optical amplifiers or EDFAs will also destroy quantum communication because it will amplify the photon, it will make one photon into a thousand photons and suddenly an eavesdropper can steal the information. So to make it work, we actually need to bypass these EDFAs and we need to isolate all the classical channel that is running by about 80 decibels. Again, 80 decibels means 1 into 10 to the power minus 8, right? So you are going to uh, ensure that not even one classical photon is going to come into the quantum channel um, with that probability, right? 1 e minus 8. Okay, so that's 10, 10 in 1 billion. That's the sort of number. So there are other protocols that try to circumvent this problem and that this one is one called measurement device independent where you can see that the detector is at the center at a place called Charles and then you have two such setups coming from Bob and Alice and because each side can be 100 kilometers you will get 200 kilometers right. So people continue to work to expand these distances. Uh, Five minutes. Okay. So. Thank you. What are we trying to do out here is work with metro areas, right? Metro areas are also very challenging and we want to be able to set up these networks. And just like uh, Cambridge did it, we are now setting it up between IIT Madras, IIT Madras Research Park, Society for Electronic Transaction Security and the National Informatics Center, right? So these sort of networks will be short haul and they will allow us to build quantum key distribution networks by using a combination of secure nodes, user networks, cryptographic applications. Another way to do it is to actually use free space and uh, we can also run it as line of sight, but you cannot go very far. You can do a few kilometers. Maybe you can even do 20 kilometers, but the efficiency keeps dropping down. But all of these things are possible and that's what we attempt to do. So where are we headed with this? Why is it important for all of you to listen to this? So our current plan is to aim to go from Chennai to Delhi. Right? Just the way China was able to do it from Shanghai to Beijing, we said, okay, let's do Chennai, Delhi. But we first do Chennai, then we do Chennai, Bangalore, and then from Bangalore, we go to Delhi, right? And we need what are called secure nodes every 25, every 100 kilometers. So you need about 25 nodes. And then you go from, you know, Bangalore to Hyderabad to Bhopal to Delhi. Right? So this is a very ambitious plan and we hope that we will uh, be able to do this over the next few years. Um, and uh, from everybody we have talked to, I think it's a, uh, they're all excited about it. So I'm hoping that uh, this thing will actually indeed kick off. So it's a complicated endeavor that we have tried. And uh, so, you know, it's not something that an academic a professor at IIT Madras can do by themselves. And so we always look for partnerships. We reach out to other organizations. We reach out to other universities and say, okay, this is the plan. This is where we want to go. Are you willing to join us to build the quantum internet, right? So the quantum internet is something that is going to be a, become a reality for two reasons. One is to secure our public key infrastructure against quantum computers. And the second reason is to connect two quantum computers together so that you can do parallel computing, parallel quantum computing, right? So these are sort of the ideas that uh, affect what you, what the future will hold for you. 
Let me stop here with uh, uh, acknowledgement slide. Uh, this is what I call the QT. We have a large number of faculty now involved in these efforts. A couple of students at the bottom who have been instrumental in driving a lot of this work. And uh, it's very interdisciplinary. There's computer science, there's electrical engineering, there's even mechanical engineering, there's physics. Uh, we, we are very uh, welcoming of everybody who wants to work in this playground. So if you are interested in what you have heard today, please do reach out to me and we'd be happy to see how we can find collaborations. Thank you very much. So I can take questions now if there are some. Yeah, maybe, you know, I, I think if you can uh, highlight what would be its immediate impact on the PKI, particularly yes. if you look at the hash or uh, the RSA or whatever that algorithm is, knowing that quantum computing is a long way to go, whereas quantum communication and quantum information processing is a different aspect or the other. And uh, if we double uh, the bits, will the cryptocurrency be saved? And what is your view? And what is the, you would suggest for the government of India? See, I will say th this, what I started with my motivation. It's a question. When will we know that our public key infrastructure is insecure? And the answer is we will not know it until we have lost a lot of our information. So if there are state or non-state actors who are going to compromise our infrastructure by tapping into our fiber optic network, they will start doing it today or they may have already started doing it simply because they can store this data. And then when the com quantum computer becomes available, they will decrypt it. So that is one very real problem. And so the recommendation right now is to secure whatever critical infrastructure we have as quickly as we can. Right? Uh, and you don't want a, a situation of, for example, WikiLeaks happening where, you know, someone just got lots of data and then just puts it out on the internet for everyone to see. So that's a very real um, a problem. And we will not know. I, I, I believe there's a case where the U.S. knew that the AES was insecure, but they left this trap door open so that they could use it, right? So people are constantly out there trying to get our data. And what quantum communications does is it says that it will provide you with unconditional security. Of course, that is, comes with the caveat that you have to implement it correctly. Otherwise, it is as insecure as anything else, right? So the implementations uh, are also important, but there are some proofs that say that you can get uh, unconditionally secure. So my recommendation to the government is to identify critical infrastructure and start securing it, right? So I even tell, say that uh, maybe we should do plan for the central vista that is coming up. Why not make the central vista quantum secure today? Plan for it today so that, you know, when there is a quantum computer in five years, that will make it uh, uh, insecure, you are already secured. So that sort of forward thinking is definitely required. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for thank joining you us. Much. Thank you very much.